be with you this morning. For those of you who are new here, or you're tuning in for the first time on Facebook Live, or uh, coming in on Jefferson Baptist Virtual later, my name is Brendan, and I am the pastor of Jefferson Baptist Church, and it is good to worship with all of you this morning. If you would, uh, turn in your Bibles or devices to Luke chapter 12. We're going to be looking at verses 35 through 48. On the Pew Bibles, uh, that's page 1,618 through 1,619. And as you turn there, keep in mind that uh, all of chapter 12 so far has been Jesus teaching the disciples, then turning back to the crowd, and then turning back to the disciples to continue teaching them. And last week, Jesus turned to his students and taught them not to be anxious or afraid, and us as well. Now he continues teaching them changing his tone from that of a gentle, guiding shepherd uh, to teach as the serious, authoritative Son of Man. And his words gave the disciples both a command and a warning as his followers. So his uh, words do the same for us here today. And so we need to listen uh, to Jesus' words to us um, because they are uh, important for us as his followers. And so this is God's word to us. From Luke chapter 12, verses 35 through 48. Listen to it this morning. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom their master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready. The Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. <coughs> Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, My master is delayed in coming, And he begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. (coughs) The master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. At an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved the beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. This is God's word. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for your word. Uh, It's a hard word to us this morning as your disciples. Lord, I pray you would open our hearts and our minds to hear it so that we can uh, be ready that we can expect your coming uh, and be ready for it. And Lord, we know that it's by the power of your Spirit that that will be the case. And so Lord, work in us now so that we can hear and be diligent to apply the words uh, that you are speaking to us this morning so that we can uh, be faithful in building your kingdom uh, both here uh, and as we go. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So throughout chapter 12 of Luke, Jesus has dealt with the reality that our Human nature draws us to comfort, comforts that often can become sinful uh, because they pull our hearts and our minds away from resting in and pursuing the kingdom of God for ourselves and for our neighbors. As we so easily embrace the comforts of this life, our souls can speak, and often it's in ways that we don't even know or hear, that we should just simply relax, eat, drink, be merry as the fool spoke to his soul not too long ago in chapter 12. And inevitably, this leads us to fear and anxiety as we rest in these comforts, because 
It pulls the treasure of our hearts and divides it between the world and Jesus. And not only that, but the laziness that our luxury, our luxurious living can bring is not what Jesus has called us to as his disciples. Our text today shows us that our involvement as followers of Jesus is to be meaningful, continuous, and intentional as we seek obedience to his kingdom. It is in an active, purposeful living we receive the promises of blessing of his kingdom. Jesus calls us to be blessed Christians living and living in a life of commitment to readiness for his return. And so that is what the Spirit is speaking to us through the text this morning. He is calling us to stay ready for the Son of Man. And we stay ready first because he will come unexpectedly, and second because he will come in execution. So we're to stay ready for the Son of Man first because he will come unexpectedly. So Jesus is continuing his teaching in the undesignated place while surrounded by this huge crowd that's pressing in on them and or even trampling over themselves. And he continues his teaching, moving away from the commands of do not be anxious and do not be afraid to a command for action for his disciples, for them to be ready in verse 35. He says, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. This command of Jesus is what will dominate the entire sections of the teaching here. And so we need to understand what Jesus is telling us. And there are really two parts of this command Jesus is giving to his disciples to participate in and being ready. First, they are to stay dressed for action. This is more literally understood and, and translated as gird up your loins. For those of you who like the King James Version, there's some phraseology for you like that. So uh, what does this mean? What does gird up your loins mean? Well, it in the times of Jesus, men and women did not wear jeans and dress pants. They wore cloaks that came down to their feet. So if you weren't careful and you attempted to run without hiking up your robe like a girl walking around taking pictures before the fall formal, your attempt to run would lead to you tripping over your cloak bottom. So Jesus is telling his disciples, your cloaks are not to hinder your readiness when I am coming. In other words, for us, keep your britches hyped up and stay ready. <laughs> Bet you didn't know that high waters were kingdom ready attire, did you? So the second part of his command is keep your lamps burning. Lamps produce light, but they are not like electricity that flows as long as the switch is on, keeping the light bulb on, illuminating our rooms or our houses. Lamps in Jesus' time required maintenance, uh, refueling of olive oil that would allow for the lamp to continue burning. If your oil runs out, so does your light. And so the whole point Jesus is getting at for his disciples and for us in this command is that we'd be ready, perpetually ready. We should never not be ready for Jesus coming. And we see this in the statement that follows his command, really giving an illustration of what he means in verse 36. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. These servants were not passively boasting that they had been baptized or received as members of the church some years ago. They were not apathetically avoiding spiritual nourishment and prayer, fellowship, and study of God's Word. They were not lazy and sluggardish in their expectation of the coming of their master. No, they were like a dog whose master had gone out for the day, and at every noise is running up to the window and peering out to see whether he has arrived, always ready to meet him with tail wagging with that great excitement and expectation. Our disposition, our state of mind and of body should be ready for Jesus, for He is coming to knock. And when, the and when the Master knocked, the servants were ready to open immediately, at once, as our text says. This signals active, meaningful anticipation of His return. And so we ought to stay ready in the same manner. And why might we desire to stay ready for Jesus, or the Son of Man coming back? Well, because there is a blessing in our being alert concerning His approach. In verse 37 we read, Blessed are those servants whom the Master finds awake when He comes. Truly, I say to you, He will dress Himself for service and have them recline at table, and He will come and serve them. Humble, <clears throat> diligent Christian servanthood is met with blessing. 
Jesus promises that as we serve Him in readiness of His coming, we will receive the reward of Christ raising us up, glorifying us as siblings and heirs with Him to the promise of eternal life. And the Apostle Peter wrote it this way to suffering Christians in his day. He said in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6-11, through 11, He said, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you to Him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We will be exalted. What a promise of hope for us. But this promise requires persistence in our efforts of serving Him through the power of the Holy Spirit. In verse 38 we read, But know this, that if, in verse 30, If He comes in the second watch, or in the third, and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. And the watches here show us that it might be a long and dark wait until our Master comes to raise us up with Him, but He is coming. You see, there were four watches in the night for the Roman guard, and there were three watches by the Jews of that day. Luke was likely referring to the Jewish understanding here, and that's where I'm going. So the second and third watches divided by the Jewish divisions would have been from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. I don't know about you, but that's past my bedtime. <laughs> and so as servants of Jesus, there is a great blessing to be awaiting Him, even as our head is bobbing and our eyes are getting tired from lack of sleep. Because when He returns, we can rest in eternal bliss. The blessings that He's going to give us as we receive the words, Well done, my good and faithful servants. Now enter my rest. You see so if you're a Christian stuck in apathy toward Jesus, or you show no readiness for Christ's coming in your life, listen to what He says and repent, because the night might be long and wearying upon this earth, but make no mistake, Christ is coming for us. He's coming for you. The day is dawning soon when Christ is going to show Himself in all His power and glory. And as we will see, we do not want to be unprepared when He returns. And return he will at a time no one knows, just as a thief in the night, as we read in verse 39 through 40. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And so we must stay ready for Jesus. Stay ready for the Son of Man because he is coming back soon but unexpectedly. We've already seen that He has commanded us to be ready because of His imminent and certain return. And as we turn to our second reason for staying ready, Jesus reiterates the need to be ready and the blessings that will follow being ready. But this time, He also emphasizes hard reality of an expectation that is opposite to the blessings for those of us who do not heed His words. And so we need to tune in and listen here. And so we're to stay ready for the Son of Man because He will come unexpectedly, but then also because He will come in execution. So Jesus has been teaching His disciples, and of course, for some reason, Peter, being the often dense disciple of the group, uh, decided that he needed to ask a clarifying question about this teaching. And, and to give Peter some credit, it actually does clarify for us what Jesus is talking about. So Peter asks this question in verse 41. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And what, come, and what we come to understand from the response of Jesus that follows is that these teachings are universally applicable to all disciples. And also to anyone who might desire to be a disciple or to those of us who might think we are disciples. Which is why we need to listen to what Jesus is about to say this morning. So Jesus answers Peter and he says this in verse 42. And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager? 
whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time. What is the answer to this question? We are. As disciples, we are stewards of God's grace through Jesus Christ. Paul, although he was speaking of himself as an apostle, said this to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. He said, This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Just because we are not apostles does not mean we get to pass the buck on this duty. We bear the responsibility of gospel proclamation, as do all spirit-filled, empowered Christians. We dispense it to those who need to hear and be fed by the word of God unto salvation. And the proper time to feed the world the bread of life in Jesus Christ our Lord is today. If you do not know Christ, if you do not know the salvation and hope of eternal life that He alone offers through His death on the cross and the resurrection unto eternal life, repent and believe in the name of Jesus, the Son of Man, who is coming to judge both the living and the dead. And we bear this responsibility as the followers of Jesus because as He has already promised us previously in verse 37, so He promises again that we will receive blessings as we proclaim the gospel and bring the kingdom of God to bear upon the world around us. As we humble ourselves in bondservant obedience to Him, we will be exalted to rule with Christ. In verses 43 and 44 we read, Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. Then Jesus interjects a big but here, though. One that might cause some of us listening or gathered here a measure of serious discomfort. And in fact, it should cause all of us conviction and discomfort this morning from what he says. We read this in verses 45 through 48. But if that servant says to himself, My master is delayed in coming, and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Jesus gives a direct challenge, a warning to His disciples to remain faithful, to show themselves worthy of the manner they had been called, as Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 says. And if we claim to be disciples, then Jesus' warning is to us as well. You see, we are typical blue-collar people who are just trying to live good lives. We're generally moral people by societal standards, and because of this, we have a strange sense of security in our standing before God. Our typical mode of determining whether someone who goes to church is going to heaven is that they are decent people. Yet how many of you say you're good Christian people, but do not even know what the Bible commands? On the other hand, how many of you know exactly what the Bible says yet rationalize away its clear commands to fit your own personal worldview. All of us at times find some way to skirt around the clear commands given to us by our Lord, which is why we need to test our hearts and minds here and see if in our minds and hearts there is one single thought or serious consideration of the fact that the Son of Man is coming to execute judgment upon the earth or whether we live totally absorbed in ourselves, entirely unaware and unready for the coming of the One who is going to bring the execution of judgments upon the souls of all humanity. We need to stay ready, because the severity of judgment Jesus is going to execute should terrify us. And His judgment is executed in three ways to three servants. But before we get to the servants, I just want to take note of the contrast that we have seen of Jesus throughout chapter 12. 
Jesus began teaching in softness to his followers as a friend in Luke chapter 12, verse 4. And then as a guiding shepherd in Luke 12, verse 32. But now, Jesus is not speaking as a mamby-pamby preacher. He's not speaking as a rosy rabbi. And He's not speaking as some lovey-dovey Lord. No, He is speaking as the Son of Man, the judgment and executioner over our eternal souls. And His words are clear, concise, without equivocation or ambiguity as He speaks of judgment to His servants who claim Him as his Lord, but do not obey what he says. And Jesus begins with first servant. The first servant received the most dreadful of judgments. Jesus literally promised punishment so severe that the servant who claimed to know his ways rejected them and then hurt other people in his rebellion would be cut into pieces and put with the unfaithful. He would be discarded into the fires of hell as a dismembered corpse to burn and suffer for eternity. As teachers, or if you know God's word and refuse to abide by it, even leading others astray and harming them in your disobedience, your judgment will be the most severe if you do not repent and turn back to faithfulness and preaching and teaching and guiding others in truth. The second servant, too, was severely punished. The servant knew God's will, but still refused obedience to it. He read his Bible without applying it to his life, so to speak. And this servant did not harm anyone else but himself, but he still did not escape judgment. If you claim to be a Christian and know what to do to grow as a believer, yet you refuse Listen to what Jesus says here. Turn to Him and begin to obey what the Spirit has spoken in God's Word. But Jesus goes even further in His judgment as the Son of Man, as He turns to the final servant. The final person to receive judgment is an ignorant servant of God's will. So many Christians today are well-intentioned but profoundly ignorant of God's Word. As the saying goes, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. Blissful ignorance of what God requires of you as His disciple will not bode well when the time comes for you to stand in judgment. God in Hosea says it this way to the priests who failed to know His Word. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6 he says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. You have the Word of God at your fingertips in our society. CDs, audio versions, paperbacks, hardcovers, study Bibles. You have God's Word galore. And because of this, Christ will not entertain your excuses or pleadings to be spared from hell due to your self-imposed ignorance of His commands. We must repent of our ignorance and take ready responsibility as disciples of Jesus to all we have been trusted if we truly are His followers. As we see in verse 48. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. As we come to grips with the reality of Christ's true character, as our friend and shepherd, but also as our Lord and judge, we should fear his power with faith-filled readiness for his return. We should not be discouraged, but we should be encouraged for the justice and the fullness of the kingdom of God will come when He arrives. As will the blessed reward that we have been promised as we receive Him, His ready, humble, and faithful servants. You see, Paul wrote the same thing to the church at Thessalonica, to the Thessalonians there. He wanted to encourage them that the day was drawing near that the Son of Man would return. And so I want to end encouraging you as Christ's disciples here with Paul's words from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. 
He says, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. So be encouraged. Our Lord is coming. As followers of Jesus, we must stay ready for the Son of Man. For He is coming when we do not expect. And when He comes, He will execute judgment over us all. So stay ready for the Son of Man. Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Your Word is powerful. Lord, help us to take heed to what You have called us to as Your servants. Lord, it is an easy thing to be drawn away by the winds and the cares of this world. And so, Lord, help us to turn to You. Help us to rest in the truth of Your Word and the blessed hope that we have in Jesus Christ, the One who is coming again to show Himself in power and glory, to give us all that He has promised. Or may we be strengthened in Him. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.